is supine. Here, sugar is not opposed. Not having examined the wound, grabbing a thief rag, tying him, related to the vulture, and Take however, in varying sides in the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, you, they, they are double, for the sake, and rapid exploration requires most brutal class of the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal. Electronic literature is two words that go together, that go together. Involving text that resonates with inspirations, that can get resonates with uh, problems with media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media. Hammer's cut, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation, digitization, transformation. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Max Paint. If anyone knows what that is, it's just a, like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself, click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text, the graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read, and the device has to be electronic. And I work with artists' books. Um, I'm influenced by the works by Charles Campbell works, um, by um, works in San Jose, which has become a life for the art space of San Jose State, which is even more, more curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between digital arts and halfway between writing. Mm -hmm. And of course, performance art also that I was associated with, and the artist's books. So those were of interest that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine-enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional prints or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines, and they don't exist uh, in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raised in the dirt, only several colors, all the one structure erect, varieties and symmetric, packets of seeds, biscuits, the several modular rows. smooth, location of super stars, magnified the bottom, darker than the habitual shadow. We're all moving toward storytelling in digital space, and some of the most interesting experiments that are happening are in um, electronic literature. You're coming out of a, a Dadaist tradition uh, of saying there's there's something beyond this, and and I'm I'm going to rearrange this stuff and and find other layers beyond the physical, or make. I think electronic literature is digital born literature that would not exist otherwise than by mediation through a computer. Electronic literature is the exploration of how we can tell stories with the augmentation uh, of technology. So what technology makes possible in our storytelling palette. I'm particularly thinking about kind of the networked and connected tissues of literature and storytelling and the ways that we realize those through the technologies we already use all the time, particularly on the web. The lack of clear signal erosion from text to text field and a rather an invitation to read either in physical view or paper and poetry and also a check. This one will be to invite you. Electronic literature can be a number of things. It's, it's interactive. It has to do with words and images. I go in and out of what to call myself. I still say different things. But within the community, I create electronic literature, which, which I would call poetic narrative. So I'm a poet who works with narrative. I, I think the day that comes that we don't actually d distinguish it as electronic literature is the day that, that uh, we finally, uh, well, I, will be the day that we'll, we don't have to ask questions like that again. Uh, 
the other world with us here? Up here. Ah, but wouldn't you like the other world ah, with us here? But wouldn't you like the other world up with here? us here? Just for a visit? Just beside the trail as you cross the hill. Wonder how you feel in the tall tussle grass. Why do you pine in the morning silence? The smell of hot and fresh. Traversal is a process by which um, a user, performer, author performs a work of electronic literature on the original hardware and with the original software for which the work was produced. It's intended to capture the cultural context of a work. And that includes everything from sound to glitches to the look and feel of the interface to the way we interact with the keyboard and those kinds of physical material processes. You yes, have to structure, structure equals meaning. Because you have to understand where you're really going to end up. Yes. You can't just throw your words on a page. Hi. Welcome to the first traversal for the 2019-2020 season here in the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Dr. Dini Rigar. I'm the director of the lab, and I'm happy to announce that we're working with Eric Steinhardt's Fragments of the Dionysian Body made with HyperCard 2.2 .2 in 1997. Today's traversal is performed by Dr. Anna Knocker, who is from Poland, but doing a uh, Fulbright in residence at Winona State University with Davin Heckman and Tala Mehmet. Without further ado, I'd like to turn this event over to Dr. Knocker. Hello everyone, thank you very much Dini for inviting me. Thank you Electronic Literature Lab. I'm so pleased to be here and so uh, uh, so honored to be able to read fragments of a Dionysian body for you today. And I'll start with a brief introduction of the actual object, which is this booklet um, with uh, the CD in it, uh, on which the actual um, work is stored. And we have also the accompanying booklet with some information on the work itself. And um, uh, Eric Steinhardt um, um, uses, his hope is to be able to use hypertext as a tool of uh, philosophical inquiry, which I think by its, in itself is extremely interesting as an idea. So, um, so uh, what he finds um, uh, particularly um, um, thrilling in uh, Nietzsche's work is its hypertextual nature, uh, mainly thanks to uh, aphorism. Those who are more familiar with Nietzsche's work know all too well that aphorisms is one of the uh, uh, preferred way uh, uh, of writing uh, for, for Nietzsche. So, um, so um, uh, what we have here on the screen is the opening uh, uh, screen and as uh, you can see um, we can proceed uh, by way of uh, uh, intro introduction or the list of topics so two different modes of reading this work and uh, Steinhardt himself recommends using list of topics uh, um, to those readers who are more familiar with Nietzsche's work uh, I think I'll uh, I pick up uh, another mode, uh, this introductory um, um, way, uh, because uh, I would like to uh, present the full, um, uh, the full potential of this uh, of this work, which is, I think, um, 
uh, the idea to uh, use the hypertext as a method of philosophical, of a teaching philosophy, basically. So, uh, so I will start with uh, introduction, and uh, we can do it um, uh, we, again. We can use two different ways uh, um, uh, proceeding with this. Uh, if you click on this eye, uh, you, you will get an introductory image. And the images are important here because, um, uh, because as Steinhardt reminds us, uh, Nietzsche himself uh, was um, uh, fond of using symbols, certain symbols that uh, uh, connoted um, um, the specific ideas. So for example, life is symbolized uh, by a tree and thought is symbolized by a bird. And we have volcano, storm, island, wave, which is another very important symbol. Uh, and um, I think it's particularly um, uh, apt, considering the fact that in the introduction to a uh, um, second edition, because uh, I'm referring here to the gay science, the main uh, uh, um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche's work that, um, that Steinhardt's um, builds on. So I'm referring to the gay science and uh, um, the um, um, preface to the second edition contains uh, um, a really interesting fragment when Nietzsche writes, um, it seems to be written in the language of the wind that brings a tow. It contains high spirits, unrest, contradiction, and April weather so that one is constantly reminded of winter's nearness, as well as of the triumph over winter that is coming, must come, perhaps has already come. And I think this phrase sort of captures the, the spirit and the atmosphere of, of, this, um, of this work, uh, I mean the gay science, uh, which is imbued with the imagery uh, uh, taken directly from the nature itself. So, uh, 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 so, uh, uh, getting to know this, uh, getting to know uh, fragments of a Dionysian body by way of starting with uh, the images is, uh, uh, is relevant um, and accurate uh, method to, to get acquainted with, uh, with uh, both Nietzsche's philosophy and Steinhardt's take on it. And since it is written, since it is done, since it is hypercard, um, um, there's also some uh, uh, peculiarities concerning the interface and the way of uh, navigating uh, the content. Um, um, I, I think one of those peculiarities concerns how we move back. There's no easy way to uh, move backwards. So once you uh, uh, progress to the next content, uh, you have to find your way back and for me, uh, using the upwards um, ne um, arrows is, uh, uh, I guess, the most efficient way to do it. Uh, it. It has to do with the specific architecture that Steinhardt uh, uses uh, uh, in how he organizes the Nietzsche's um, um, uh, book. Um, basically, uh, he groups um, uh, cards into topics uh, uh, and organize the topics uh, as a hierarchical top-down system, um, much like a table of contents. Uh, it has uh, a lot to do with how HyperCard uh, was, um, uh, was uh, designed, uh, but we also have another uh, level, the, the second uh, order of, of organization here, uh, which is kind of obvious considering that it is hypertextual novel. So we have all the hypertext links between the terms uh, w which work like a system of cross references. So we have like two structures. One is top down, hierarchical and meant as a table uh, of content and another one uh, cuts through uh, and works as a system of uh, cross references. Um, of, of course, we also have uh, the alpha alphabetical index, which is a um, list of 
topics, basically. And there are also illustrations and diagrams that clarify the main concepts. So uh, I will move, um, I will progress through this work um, um, step by step, and I might get loose sometimes <laughs> because uh, because I, I think actually this is the nature of a uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's work as well. Uh, it sort of invites the reader to get loose in it, to, to, uh, to ponder on it uh, without thinking about uh, the clarity of a system. Uh, as we know, Nietzsche was not this kind of a philosopher who would come up with a system, even if, uh, as uh, we're reminded by Steinhardt, Steinhardt um, uh, Nietzsche's, um, uh, Nietzsche's thought and his oeuvre and his uh, approach is based on a quite rigorous study of scientific concepts. So it is not that he's rambling. Uh, there is basically, I think, a very um, creative way uh, to, to think, because basically philosophy is uh, how we think about the world, about ourselves, ourselves in this world, about how we get to know uh, the world. So uh, for me, the recurrent theme in fragments of a Dionysian body is, um, uh, is a question of how epistemology and ontology are interwoven with each other. And this is a great subject in philosophy that um, uh, I think recently got uh, another, uh, another um, 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 version, so to speak, with a great debate between or, um, object-oriented ontology by, for example, Graham Harman and uh, uh, relationalism of Bruno Latour, on the other hand. This is for those who are uh, more versed in the contemporary philosophy or philosophical debates. So in other words, uh, the discussion between what was first, the way we are in the words, or uh, how we know the word. That's also how we can um, um, uh, how we can sum up this debate in a nutshell. So I will be moving along the axis between epistemology and ontology, trying to, uh, uh, to grasp uh, some of the main concepts uh, in both fields, some of the main ideas, main um, terms there. So if we start with epistemology, uh, we get another uh, list of topics. And so, uh, so I move through introduction here so we can see what it's all about. And uh, as we can read, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Um, and epistemologists are concerned with defining knowledge. Um, and what's particularly interesting for me is uh, Nietzsche's uh, perspectivism. That will th that is a concept that will that will come up um, um, uh, quite often, I guess, uh, in, in in my reading. Uh, so, uh, uh, what perspectivism means, uh, we could ask. Uh, so let's have a look. So again, we have perspectivism and uh, introduction. So I will I will I will click on introduction, and uh, here is uh, another interesting lexia that. Um, uh, and we have some um, novelty here. Uh, apart from a, from a, a typical uh, 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 text field here, we also have a, a, a box with, uh, which looks like a kind of an um, um, index of terms uh, with numbers. And um, uh, this is actually uh, the reference to the gay science. And the numbers are not the, the page numbers. These are the sequence numbers or, or paragraphs numbers. That's how uh, Nietzsche's work is um, uh, referenced to uh, by, by way of uh, um, um, uh, outlining uh, the, the um, um, paragraphs numbers rather than pages numbers. Um, so, uh, so this is also the clear sign that the probably preferred, preferred way of reading uh, the fragments of a Dionysian body is actually uh, uh, the continuum between the actual book and its uh, hypertextual version. So we could say that in a way uh, Steinhardt proposes uh, um, the augmented uh, uh, book, so, so, so to speak, the augmented reality before he was, if, before it was even 
um, invented or, or, or proposed, because uh, he cues us to uh, move, uh, to shift between uh, the actual text written by a uh, philosopher and the screen uh, with all those hypertextual connections and relations um, 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 uh, made available by Steinhardt. So, um, so already the first sentence is uh, right um, uh, to the point of what uh, uh, I uh, ha had said before, uh, uh, namely that perspectivism is both ontological and epistemic. So this is the bridge I, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, the, the, the way to, to combine both uh, domains of philosophical inquiry. So uh, uh, further, uh, Steinhardt continues, ontologically it asserts that the world is ultimately a system of relations. Everything is embedded uh, in a system of relations, a context, and uh, relations are logically prior to things. Um, uh, the game of life shows this priority of relations. Perspectivism does not entail subjectivism, rather it entails that there are independent um, um, levels of description that correspond um, to it uh, functional organization. And here we have uh, kind of a trouble that comes from uh, this work being probably um, um, read by Hypercard 2.2, while uh, it was uh, probably done in the earlier version of the program. Because as you can see, uh, the, the links, the hypertextual links, cover the, act, the text a bit. So uh, in other words, I have to perform uh, perform uh, investigative reading, so, 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 sort of. I mean, in most cases, it's just one or two letters which is missing from the word, uh, but sometimes it is more than that, or, or, or it is actually, or, or the, the, um, the order of the sentence is, uh, um, um, is um, um, mixed, so, uh, so we're not really sure what happens here in the text. And, um, and I think it is a um, uh, particularly interesting way of intervention from so-called uh, uh, cybernetic agent, uh, which would be a kind of an error inherent in uh, digital uh, technologies, especially in uh, reading, writing techno uh, digital technologies, uh, where we have all kinds of, I mean, all the possibilities where errors can, can happen um, uh, and it is connected to uh, versioning, to, uh, uh, to actual bugs in the program, to uh, all kinds of accidents that can you know, happen or emerge all of a sudden and we, uh, often we don't even know the, the source or reason for it. And I, I find it particularly interesting in the case of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's work because uh, the error was another concept that features prominently throughout his work. So I think it's like um, the form and the content uh, are bridged here, are, are fused together, uh, which is also uh, interesting uh, from the point of view of the very title, uh, because the gay science uh, is actually uh, the notion taken from um, uh, from um, uh, um, uh, medieval poetry. Uh, the gay science relates to the notion of gay sabre. Uh, which was 18th century Provencal poetry. And these were poets who were knights at the same time. And the way they performed, it was actually poetry that was performed. So in a performance, we've had this unity of a content and a form. Uh, and um, and the, the gay science actually relates to this idea of, uh, of this unity between content and the form. So, uh, so um, in uh, other words, uh, the subject we talk about is presented in such a way that we are cued to further interrogate it. So that's where the form it and the content means. Uh, and I think it is also um, uh, the way to, uh, to understand this uh, bridge between the screen, the digital version, the hypertextual version, and the actual fragments. Because let me check these um, numbers, so perspective, 
uh, we have here reference to uh, sequence number 15. And as, I, uh, as I'm uh, talking, uh, I am at the same time, I'm locating this sequence in a text of the gay science. So uh, yeah, so um, this is interesting because you know, it is also kind of a textual machine that's present in several other works, for example, um, um, for example, where we have, um, for example, itching, which is also based on this uh, references between the numbered um, um, textual fields, uh, where you get directed into a, a particular lexias by way of using oracle, by way of uh, uh, manipulating uh, the, the additional system. Uh, so, so to me, it is also a, a hint at the, this, at, at all the systems, at, at all the ways to move through the text, uh, which are not purely textual. We have to perform some kind of activity to actually get to the content. I think probably closest to our experience would be Julio Cortazar, Cortazar's um, uh, uh, novel, where you have the paragraphs numbered and uh, you get directed to um, uh, to. Uh, th there's a sequence of reading based on a particular order. So, uh, so it is also a play, uh, a nice play between uh, chance and uh, and uh, and the order between between the chaos and the order. There's uh, so much to think about in this case. So, anyway, I'm at the sequence number 15, uh, where we are directed. Um, um, uh, where we queued to look for what perspective is, how it is understood. And from, from what I see here, it is a longer um, um, quotation, so I just, uh, I think I just uh, quote a bit of it. Uh, it starts uh, with a phrase, from a distance. This mountain makes the entire region it dominates attractive and significant in every way. Having said this to ourselves for the hundredth time, we are so unreasonably and thankfully disposed toward it that we suppose that it, the bestower of such delight, must itself be the most delightful thing in the region. And so we climb it and are disappointed. Suddenly the mountain itself and the entire landscape around us, beneath us, seem to have lost their magic. We had forgotten that certain types of greatness, like certain types of goodness, want to be beheld, beheld only from a distance and always from below, not from above. Only thus do they have an effect. So this is a perspectivism uh, 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 understood in also in a very literal uh, uh, way as a kind of a change of a position. Uh, but I think perspectivism here, it, what is important is that uh, that uh, we think of the words and objects in it uh, as based on a system of relations, which is particularly, um, um, uh, I think, um, uh, accurate um, um, uh, considering the fact that we're performing this text through hypertext which is also a system of relations. So like perspectivism is inscribed into hypertext itself. So uh, indeed, as Steinhardt um, uh, demonstrates, uh, the Nietzsche's work is uh, so suitable to be presented as a, as a, as a hypertext. Um, and what's more, um, uh, he says, uh, Steinhardt says, relations are logically prior to things. And this is actually, uh, uh, core of this great debate between Latour and object-oriented ontology. So we could also use uh, Steinhardt's hypertext as a kind of a, uh, of um, um, uh, connotations to uh, the, the, the most contemporary discussions going on. Uh, also with the feminist uh, materialism where there was, this was a great subject with Karen Barad and Elizabeth Grosh and uh, and um, um, uh, many other philosophers, Claire Colbrook, and there's a whole list of great uh, names of uh, female philosophers who also pondered on it. So as you see, it is just, it's just one uh, short lexia and so much content, I mean, it is so vibrant. But I would uh, take uh, the liberty of, um, of its hypertextual qualities uh, because we have, uh, here we have, uh, 
um, here we have the observation that the game of life shows this priority of relations. And this is extremely interesting because, um, um, uh, because the fragments of uh, Dionysian body comes as a package uh, with Game of Life by John Conway, which is meant to, to show uh, the uh, emergent entities in, um, uh, in a, uh, in a um, digital uh, domain. So the Game of Life is a kind of a game where um, uh, Conway show, showed us how, um, how those um, um, entities can uh, uh, can be born and develop according to certain rules. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, it is based on a one um, uh, object that uh, gets modified um, uh, according to the rule that says that if uh, in the neighborhood there is two or three life cells, it is a cell, it is usually a cell, the black cell here, we can try, uh, yeah, we can take the glider. So for example, we have a glider. So we have one cell here, uh, which is uh, actually sort of alone. There are no neighbors around. So it means that in the next um, uh, life cycle, it will vanish, it will disappear. While here, this cell has two neighbors uh, alive. So it means that it, it will persist, it will, uh, it will, uh, continue uh, existing. So, um, so this rule says it, it's, it was very simple a rule and implemented uh, by Convy to uh, uh, to this uh, uh, game um, uh, created some kind of some, some chain of modifications that uh, worked much in, in in much like a biological life itself. So we can uh, we can set. Uh, the pattern, which is already our glider. We can set the speed of modifications and we can run it. So let's see what happens here. Yeah, so we have like four cycles where you can see how this pattern uh, uh, changed in the course of uh, the chain of events. So we can change the speed and we can run it again. Yeah, so it was a bit quicker. And we can also cha change the pattern for example, eternal return. This is another uh, um, concept uh, uh, essential for uh, Nietzsche's thought. I, I will leave it aside for, aside for now, but let's move it through the game of life. Yeah, so what we got was much more interesting here. Anyway, th this, is, this is what dynamics, dy dynamical system looks like according to uh, Steinhardt and Nietzsche. It is based on those um, a set of relations uh, which are prior to the object itself. So in other words, we have, um, we have this dynamical system, the game of life, where uh, the emergence and the stability are actually uh, two poles of, of the same continuum, uh, uh, so to speak. And, um, and, uh, uh, and this is, um, um, uh, this is, I think that the, 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 the core meaning of it is that, quoting Steinhardt, ontologically perspectivism entails that everything is embedded in a system of relations and that these relations are prior to things. Uh, in the game of life, the value of every cell is determined by its relations with itself and its neighbors. All things are patterns, um, uh, gliders appears to be a thing, is a set of patterns that are have the same form. So we see the glider as an object, but in fact, it is always object in motion. In, uh, uh, it is rather, it is the outcome of the set of modifications rather than a stable thing that's, uh, that's there. So, um, so I started with ontology, but I would like to get back to this uh, initial uh, list of topics, and uh, I would like to to dig into um, to dig into this text, starting from the other pole, which is ontology, the way of being, the the way of um, existence, the, the way the object exists in the world. And when we click on the Nietzsche's ontology, we get introduction again. Uh, so as you can see, ontology is the theory of being. It is the theory of what everything is really made of. Um, uh, so so um, 
so here comes uh, one of the crucial um, uh, concepts uh, uh, for the whole uh, over um, uh, here. For, I think uh, uh, most people who has ever uh, heard about Nietzsche's philosophy uh, will probably connote will to power as a concept, which was so tragically misunderstood uh, in the history mm -hmm. of uh, philosophy and, uh, and the social uh, history as well, and had uh, uh, disastrous consequences for, uh, I mean, historical, social, uh, uh, and also uh, conceptual. Anyway, the will of the will to power is actually not what you think it would be. It is not uh, uh, not the, um, the force that would. Uh, uh, it's, it's nothing that would enforce itself. Nothing that would. Uh, act like, um, like a dominating force, fra far from it. It's actually, the, the, the yeah, let's have a look what it is. So again, we get um, um, a set of, uh, of uh, 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 terms here. Um, so I will skip introduction this time, and I will click on, uh, uh, I think, uh, the word is will to power, because that's the interesting. And now we get another quotation from uh, Will to Power. That's another Nietzsche's work. And uh, this quotation is really interesting in, in a way that is also poetic because very often we uh, tend to forget that Nietzsche's work is very poetic when you read the text itself. Uh, sometimes it is more uh, like poetry and not only because he used the actual poetry, the actual songs uh, in the gay science, it is also because of how uh, how he writes because of his language, which is open to interpretations, and it's really vibrant and, and inspiring and fresh. And even even now, it, it, it uh, when when you really set to to um, um, uh, think about it, uh, it comes as a kind of a philosophical poetry uh, of sorts. And to dem demonstrate it, let's uh, look into how this quote begins. This word, a monster of energy without beginning, without end, a, f a firm iron magnitude of force that does not grow bigger or smaller, that does not expand itself, but only transform itself as a whole of unalterable size, a household without expenses or losses, but likewise without increase or income, enclosed by nothingness as by a boundary, not something blurry or wasted, not something endlessly extended, but set in a definite space as a definite force, and not a space that might be empty here or there, but rather as force throughout. So so I'm, I, I won't be reading the whole of it, but what comes to mind is this, uh, uh, it, it actually this fragment of a well-known Buddhist sutra called the Sutra of, uh, um, of a Heart, where we have um, a kind of a definition with, which is built on negations, not this, nor that, not form, not the content, no ear, no, no nose. So I think it is, uh, it is a, a, a very interesting way of defining it, defining what will to power is, and to, um, to further elaborate uh, on this, uh, I would refer to, um, uh, to um, uh, will to power again, but this time by way of uh, um, the will to power as a dynamical system, and he here we uh, get the set of uh, another um, concepts and, um, and ideas. So we have attractors in the will to power, which is diagram. And, um, and actually this will to power, we could, uh, uh, I mean, I have to perform a kind of a shortcut here, uh, considering that we're running out, out of time. So, um, so uh, this will to power is actually a, uh, life force itself. I mean, it is uh, uh, it is the force that sort of pulls out uh, things, uh, um, uh, imaginations, people, entities. So it is like a magnetic force, so to speak. It is uh, it is a very um, uh, it is a very um, uh, power that directs this game of life. I think it is a power that makes those, uh, those uh, uh, gliders uh, uh, to modify. 
So it is beneath uh, beneath uh, all that exists in the world to, 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 to say it in a, uh, I think, simplest way. Uh, so we have uh, different kinds of attractors. So, uh, so um, something that, that uh, uh, triggers uh, the, 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 uh, um, uh, the happenings in the world, something that, that triggers uh, the events in the world and the way we evolve and, and modify and uh, get modified and continued. So, um, so I will move a bit uh, upward in this Steinhardt system uh, to uh, move to, uh, I think, uh, uh, yes, I would like to uh, talk a bit about, um, about, um, I think, yeah, science here, uh, because here we have uh, a will to truth. Science is animated by the will to truth. Truth. So again, we have this uh, this notion of will will to, uh, which is understood as a force that moves, force that uh, inspires, that gets uh, us started, that gets uh, th that. Um, actually uh, initiates the processes. So, um, so uh, we all not only have a will to power, which I think uh, we could understand as a will to exist uh, in a basic sense. So it is not the power uh, of domination, it is the power to exist, the power to come to being, so to speak. And here we have, uh, uh, on the other hand, the science is animated by the will to truth. So, um, so we have the notion of metaphysical science and mechanistic science, and this is something I will uh, end my uh, reading with, and I will uh, uh, click on uh, the mechanistic science because it is uh, particularly in interesting to me, uh, because we have this fragment where uh, Steinhardt uh, says, um, mechanistic science produces interpretations of the world that only approximate the dynamical system, that is the will to power, because the will to power is not a machine. In the contrary, the will to power is a music box uh, whose uh, tune is meaningful, cause of the reconciliation of chance and necessity. It cannot be understood by means of mechanical anal analysis alone, but must also be understood aesthetically. The gay science aims at such an understanding. And now when I read it uh, um, here, it made me think, is a computer uh, uh, mechanical analysis alone? Far from it. I would say the hypertext is actually uh, the gay science itself, where we have both the form and the content coming together. So the way we think, uh, I'm referring here to a well-known Van Bush uh, 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 text and the proposition, the way we think, uh, we think hypertextually. Uh, much the, the way that the Nietzsche was uh, the, the Nietzsche uh, uh, was thinking, proposing this concept of a gay science, where the way we think and what we think about is basically unity is the same thing. So that would be my version of uh, the fragments of a Dionysian body. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anna, for such a lovely reading. It's such a tough thing to read because there's so much philosophy <laughs> yes, in it, and not many people are that familiar with philosophy much anymore. It was discontinued as a, as a field for a lot of universities starting around the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. mid yeah. So there's a whole generation or two of students coming up the ranks, faculty, who've never had a course in philosophy. Yeah, and thank you very much for this opportunity because actually to me, uh, well, I happen to uh, come back to reading and re-reading Nietzsche on several occasions for many reasons basically throughout my, my academic career. So that was another attempt at it. And actually having Eric Steinhardt's hypertext uh, helping me with it was, uh, was a great opportunity. Great. So I want to start by asking a question. Is there anyone in the audience that might want to ask? something before, I'm looking also on the audience online, uh, online if you're wanting to ask something, we'll ask Anna now. Anyone want to, yes, please. Uh, just to uh, open with the question, studying Nietzsche, or especially the gay science on mm. hypertext is interesting because it's not a yeah. textual form we're used to. And I'm fascinated by the gay science was the first thing that Nietzsche wrote on a typewriter. Yes. He lost oh. his sight and he wasn't able to write anymore. And in mm -hmm. that, Oh, so yeah, Professor Schiller is going to come up to the front here yeah. and ask this question. To the microphone. Yeah. Oh, right there. It's over there. I'll I'm going to turn it. this a little bit like this. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so to rephrase some of that, the gay science was the first thing that Nietzsche had composed on a typewriter, which is sort of a technological mm -hmm. interposition between himself and the text. And we're looking at through hypertext. Are there links there, do you think? in reading it on hypertext, what was written on a typewriter? It is particularly interesting a, interesting a question because, you know, I think that this mechanistic knowledge, mechanistic science, actually might refer to uh, linear technologies like, like a typewriter a bit in the sense that uh, the typewriter itself is not particularly linear or oriented, right? But when we type on it, there's practically no way to move beyond that. And uh, I think gay, the gay science, actually, as a text, when, when, you, when you take it as, as a whole, uh, with all the songs that are there, with aphoristic um, fragments, I think it was, it was, it might have been, it might have been the Nietzsche's way to struggle with the uh, fundamentally linear technology, writing technology, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, may be way, uh, it may be how he struggled with, uh, uh, with uh, the attempt at overcome it, over, overcome this linear quality of, of the writing te technologies of his uh, day, that would be my response to it. Because, you know, what fasc fascinates me in Nietzsche is his, um, is his um, the way he uses the language as well. When, when you read uh, his actual text, uh, it's, it is so, um, so unphilosophical at times. Like, it is not systemic, there is no clear um, uh, lecture, there is no um, uh, explanation of a system, it is rather poetic sensibility. Uh, so you have to move along his many axes because it is like spatial thinking, it is not linear in any sense. So, uh, yeah, I can ramble about that for, for hours. Well, so don't an interesting don't thing for the me. teaching in 375 is Ted Nelson's notion of literature and hypertext. Yeah. And Thank so it makes a lot of sense to think about the, the poetic nature mm -hmm. of Nietzsche's writing. It's one of the first philosophers I read because I found him so easy to read yeah. for that reason. And um, when I was in high school, I was reading him and thinking, this, is not, this isn't hard. <laughs> but the fact that he wrote poetically yeah. in a form that Ted Nelson sees as a literary form, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's quite interesting. Another philosopher of this sort would be Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes. And as Z, which I love, I mean, I, I used to teach every year, I used to teach my students, uh, I used to teach about hypertext, starting with Barthes as Z, which is, uh, I think, a uh, brilliant way. Actually, uh, I remember that my students were perplexed because I, I uh, basically taught them to, to read, I mean, to really read it, not to get to know what is there written, not to remember what was written, to read it, to, to discover the pleasure of, of the text. Which, which is, is Barthes' other favorite yeah, word, exactly. pleasure the, of the text. The jouissant of, yeah. of the philosophical text. I'm going to recommend, if you ever want to spend a really great afternoon, just it's a little small book called Pleasure of the Text, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. It's Roland Barthes, and it's really quite yeah. accessible to yeah. read, but it's about loving 
ideas. Yeah. It's about that yeah. part of uh, philosophy that and I find it, so interesting. It is a gay science too, yeah, because Barth so often refers to the bodily pleasures uh, yes. related to living, right? So which, bodily, which we need um, to mention, the reason why this thing is called the fragments of the Dionysian body exactly. yeah. is, it, as we've talked about in class, we've talked about the continuum of from ignorance to wisdom, right? We, we talked about Plato's notion of that yeah. and how Later, the, or some folks began to see the, the notion of ignorance as being associated with the body, and that was mm -hmm. bad. And the notion of wisdom as being the mind, and that was good. And what yeah. he's trying to do here is yeah. reconnect yeah. the body and the mind in a way that had been split. Yeah. So that it's not, there's no judgment. And later no. it was reclaimed by a, a feminist philosophy, yes, right? Yes, embodiment theory. Yeah, embodiment theory. So we can yeah. trace back those those feminist materialisms to uh, Nietzsche's uh, take on it. And I Which think is very kind of interesting because Nietzsche was yes. not that great to women. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it, it would be the, the Ridian move to read against the author, yeah. right? Which is also something that we were prompted by the hypertext itself because, uh, because actually it is a certain kind of structure or set of relations we're invited into it, so it is up to us how we perform it. Not that we're completely free to move around, that's not the case, mm -hmm. but we can sort of reconstruct our own uh, versions, mm -hmm. our own paths through it. Uh, so that's ergodic reading, how mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's ergodic, it's, it's the well-known concepts by Espen yeah. Orset, like if, how we perform the text, mm -hmm. right? Like we really read it physically, doing stuff, physically doing things. So uh, I think it's uh, th th this title, this Eric Steinhardt's notion of fragments of a Dionysian body is also very apt and accurate because um, actually hypertext is fragments of Dionysian body of Nietzsche's over. Fragments of text. We've been yeah. talking a little bit too about how in, our, in our lab about this metaphor of fragmentation and suturing. So we just finished looking at Catherine Kramer's wonderful work mm -hmm. in small and large pieces in which she physically, the, the character in the main character in the story, the protagonist, sutures her f fighting parents together into a unified parent with needle and thread. You know, and then also Shelley Jackson's Patchwork Girl, yeah. in which it's a, it, it's, a, it's a woman who's reconstructed, Frankenstein character, monster, mm -hmm. reconstructed from parts of dead people's, dead women's bodies. Mm -hmm. So the notion of suturing fragmented pieces to make sense of things was in the air mm -hmm. of, the, of this period. I was yeah. going to mention to also the thing we want to remember is that aphorism is a, aphoristic writing mm -hmm. is, is chunks of yeah. text. Snippets. Snippets. Mm -hmm. And so hypertext writing, we, we, we want to use chunks of text. Mm -hmm. So if you look at any of those hypertexts we've been studying in our class, you can kind of put your hands like that and go, that's how big that text is. Mm -hmm. That's aphoristic yeah. writing, and so it made perfect sense for yeah. Steinhardt to use HyperCard 2.2. Yeah, definitely. I would say HyperCard was probably pre-Twine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, framing it uh, in today's, mm -hmm. uh, I think, technologies and today's tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, so, sort of, because of course HyperCard was not internet-based, but basically the structure was very similar to what we have today with <laughs> Twine. Yeah. Any more questions? Come, yes, please, Dale, you want to come up? Can you let him through on the side there? Sorry about the tight space, but this is such a lovely, can you pull that up a little bit Yes, more? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that this hypertext was useful for you re-examining over Nietzsche, and as somebody who didn't learn any Nietzsche, is there something that's accessible to me as a good like companion to understand it, or should I just read Nietzsche and then go from there? You know, I would say that it is basically, uh, to me, it is much more val valuable as a way of entry in, into Nietzsche's thought because it uh, gives you the snippets. So you don't have, you don't feel sort of forced to read the whole books, right? I think that's, that might be an obstacle when we start reading mm -hmm. philosophy. That we, we see this book, it starts, we start reading, and we say it's so difficult, we, we can't uh, really uh, chew on it, right? We, we, uh, that was my, that, that was how, how my adventure with reading philosophy has started, I think in high school, I was mm -hmm. like maybe 16 years old, and I started uh, reading Carl Gustav Jung, which is so <laughs> stupid of me, I, I didn't understand a word from, from, from this book, but anyway, it drew curiosity. So uh, had I uh, Steinhardt's book back then, uh, I would probably sunk into a, 
sect into uh, uh, into Nietzsche's work because because of you know the nature of reading when you have a small portion of text and you read it and even if you don't really get it at first you know uh, uh, attempt you can th you, you think about it right you just look mm -hmm. through you you you're directed to the to the actual text and I think that the very uh, uh, the very act of moving even moving your body a bit like you know my hands I move between the screen and between other screen where, where Nietzsche's the gay science is stored. Mm -hmm. So even this movement of hands actually is important because uh, I remember this great passage from Barth's uh, text on the pleasures of uh, reading when actually he writes about when you read your, sorry, my uh, language, your bad hearts, right? Your bad hearts. Your, your bad, your bad, your ass hands. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> So um, that's 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 what he, what 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 he says. Well, so even yesterday in our class, when when, it's physical. when you when you were physically using those uh, mm -hmm. controllers yeah. to produce that animation, there's something about the act of moving and gesturing that that helps you learn and helps you take in that information. That's that's yeah. kinesthetic learning. Yeah, exactly. and that is one of several modes of learning yeah. that helps us learn. So reading. So the way I read, I, it sounds so goofy, but I keep something by my bed. And sometimes I just open it up and I just read a bit of it, you know, a little chunk at a time, just to, just to have time to think. And mm -hmm. philosophy especially invites us to look at a small piece and say, okay, so what did he just mm -hmm. say or what did she just mm -hmm. say? Okay, I need to think about mm -hmm. that. And then you move on to the next small piece. But if you sit down and go, today I'm going to read yeah. Nietzsche, yeah. you're never going to do it. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you're never going to do it. You have to read it yeah. in small pieces. What's nice about Nietzsche and even Aristotle mm -hmm. and Plato is that their texts have been chunked into small yeah. snippets and numbered. Yeah. So now you can read this small little piece and have time to think about it. Yeah, and even the very act of moving between those chapters uh, when I uh, presented the list of topics, even, even moving between those uh, particular topics is actually gaining the knowledge because you get acquainted with some terms, right? You, you know what will power, what will to power is. Okay, you know what you've seen it. You've seen it on this list of topics, right? Even if you don't remember what it is, you know that you've seen it connected to Nietzsche's thought. Right? Can I so, mention something else yeah. that you talked about? I, I think, you know, she was talking of yesterday. She came in yesterday and we brought her straight here and she began rehearsing immediately and then she was back this morning rehearsing. But one thing I want to mention, I thought, thought your choice of what you read was good. And one thing that a lot of you in the room may not be familiar with are two terms she used, and that's ontology and epistemology. And so ontology is a study of being. Like, what is, what's it mean to be human? How, what, you know, what's it mean to be, to be, to be, to exist? What is existence? Yeah. And I'm sure in the dark of night, in an existential moment of your own, you've probably wondered that question. You know, why am I here? That's at the essence what philosophers ask. And the epistemological yeah. question is, how do I know what I that know? I, and yes. I'm not talking, yeah, I'm not talking about how the brain works. I'm talking yeah. about the bigger question about how do we know things? How do we come yeah. to know stuff? Yeah. Do you remember the single uh, most oft uh, quoted uh, philosophical phrase? I think, think therefore, therefore I am. am. So that's basically ontology bridge with epistemology. So epistemology was first for Cartesius, ontology was the second, right? Yeah. So, and then it was sort of reversed by other philosophies. So I think this is a kind of a question that we, uh, all of us at some point in life, we have to grasp uh, like with, like we have to, we were confronted with those questions, whether we want it or not. So well, just to add, Anna arrived yesterday and she just had lost a friend, had just found out one of her friends had died. Just yeah, had no like idea. Yeah. Like just one of the like colleagues. One of the colleagues. So all of us have experienced death of some sort, and that experience of death helps us understand, you know, make, forces us, yeah. forces us to think yeah. about what is life. Why am I here? Yeah. What's the point? And that's teleology. teleology. Yeah. Why am I here? What's the point of this, right? Yeah. What, where am I going with myself? Yeah. You know, what the goal is. But don't be scared too much, or, or let's not be... Um, uh, said too much or let's not be more sad than needed because the game of life I presented the John Conway's mm -hmm. brilliant idea is actually about this about uh, about the moments where there is um, where there is actually um, where, where, uh, we, uh, where the, the entities stop existing they dissolve and they reappear 
or rather it's about the play between those two poles of uh, well, existence, because we, we, I think too often we think about death as non-existence, which is not true. If you, if you go outside and, and, have, and if you go for a walk around here in a forest, you will see many forms which are halfway through, like we, we're not sure whether they are dead or still alive, right? So it is part of the process, which is also the reason why I'm, I'm rather, uh, why I'm interested in uh, 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 philosophy of process rather mm -hmm. than the philosophy of being. So to me, it is not so only head. yeah, exactly. So, so rather white head than, than than other philosophies. But I think if you just start from the perspective of what you know, what's the point of this? Who am I? Where am I going? All those questions are philosophical questions that people have been asking for thousands and thousands of years, and it's always interesting to see how other people have thought through the answers to those questions and how they frame those questions, because in that it helps you answer your own uh, and you know, get through your own existential moments. And we all will face, if you've not had one yet, you will have them. I promise yeah. you, that's nothing's, part of life. Nothing's more sure than that. Nothing's more sure than that. So just getting through those dark, we call them dark moments, but they're actually moments of great light, enlightenment. Yeah, right. and especially if it's shared knowledge or shared, shared knowledge. discussion and the hypertext is as a way, it, it is a way of sharing with, it with mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Because I think the very fact that we see that there are people outside who basically struggle with, very s with the very same questions, the fundamental questions, makes it easier. Like, we're not alone. There mm -hmm. were all those philosophers who grasped with it and came to some conclusions. So we can have those discussions. Actually, it is ongoing discussion. It never ends. So that, that is a way of consolation, I think, as well. One of the reasons why I love the humanities, and I keep embracing it, embracing it, and even though our program's moving into the iSchool, I keep saying humanities, humanities, because at the heart of what we do as humans is share our knowledge and share our experience. Yeah. And we do this in many ways, and th first and foremost is through literature, right? And the literary, and art, literary arts is especially um, useful for this. And poetry, in my pers from my perspective, is the most human form of expression. It is the most poetic and the most artistic yeah. of all. And it's where we started with literary arts, mm -hmm. especially. Yeah. And so I think that's important to think about, but also just the questions alone. And they bridge different cultures, every culture, every gender, every walk of life, every, everyone shares this question of why am I here and what's the point of it? We share the humanities, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Any more questions? Qu more questions from any of you guys. That's how we can keep spirit alive. That's how we so keep spirit questions. alive. And that's how we philosophize as well. And right? we survive yeah, as we a survive. species, right? As a society. We have as time well. for one more question. And I think we have Professor yeah. Lors who's oh, going to yeah. ask this. Can we get that okay. here, a little bit closer for him? Just going back, to, uh, going back to the question about fragments. And the history of fragments in writing is certainly the way we write now. <laughs> on different platforms, but it seems that hypertext has, has, has maybe there's a resurgence, but there, it's, it died for some reason. <laughs> and I think, I'm just curious what your mm -hmm. thoughts of, that fragmented writing is, mm -hmm. is certainly mm -hmm. uh, on the rise, mm -hmm. whereas the hypertext hasn't really caught up. Just, do you have any thoughts? Well, it is, it is a huge question, actually, you know. It is something that I, I keep discussing with my students as well, because usually, at least once a year, I have a course that basically is, touches a bit on electronic literature, and I always make my students read. Make them I, read. Yeah, that's, <laughs> Love it. I use it for, for a purpose. I make them read hypertext, a hypertextual novel. And you know what they say? These are young people, right? They're supposed to be, how they call it, digital natives, right? And uh, guess what? They, uh, their um, uh, opinions after they, they, they have read anything is, it sucks. <laughs> we want the actual book, the one that has a beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it makes me wonder, you know? And when I start asking <coughs> them questions, this is how you read normally. I mean, so mm -hmm. all of you, uh, you, ever, you, ever, you, you know, after you finish your, your course, mm -hmm. you take a book and you read from the, the beginning to the end. This is how you proceed with, with text these days. And, you know, asking this kind of questions uh, and, and having the discussion, we usually come to the conclusions that far from it. This is only the cultural, um, cultural um, 
this is the way we've been taught the book looks like and the experience of reading looks like. Because in fact what they do is they read all the time the hypertextual fonts, only they're, they're not aware of that. Because, you know, Twitter is hypertextual. Everything basically is hypertextual in a web. Uh, it's yeah. And it's ubiquitous. So it's like, uh, I think hypertextual structures uh, have become epistemic, uh, epistemic um, uh, wallpaper. That's the notion. <laughs> it's not mine. I love that. I'm not, I'm not that, That's a uh, great I'm quote. not that brilliant. It, it is a quote from Nigel Thrift. Okay. As I, I was once, I, I read uh, uh, a epistemic, epistemic wallpaper. wallpaper. Love that. So um, it is something that, you know, just vanishes from view. But in fact, it is something that structures the very way we think about the world. So I think that's that's what happened to I would argue another thing, though, days. is that it, I would say that it's what we choose to have our students read. So if you have them read, I and mean, I think one of the reasons why I think Shelley Jackson's Patchwork Girl is so classic and so famous is it's, you can take any part of it and read it and not miss anything else. So it's, it's not... It, it's not like try, you don't have to read the whole mm -hmm. thing to, to get something from yeah. it. Some works do require you to mm -hmm. read a whole lot of it, mm -hmm. and you're still struggling with understanding mm -hmm. some of it. Mm -hmm. But then something like Patchwork Girl, you can just read the arm yeah. or read a piece yeah. of the leg, and you get a really good sense of that work without feeling like you've lost something. But it is difficult. I, I must admit that reading hypertext as a, for example, novel or it is difficult for me as well. And I had the same experience with uh, fragments of a Dionysian body because I'm so much used to uh, the book as a concept, even if mm -hmm. those days I practically don't read it as a book. Because, you know, don't get me wrong, but the last time I read the whole book, you know, from the very <laughs> beginning to the very end, I think it was... I can't even remember. Probably 2001, yeah, 2002. Yeah, I, I can't, really, frankly, I can't even remember because our experience these days is structured in a completely different way. And I think, Dini, in your and Stuart Morthope's book, Intraversals, there was this concept of ocean, you know, that was Stuart's chapter. Yeah, it's like ocean of text. Yeah, it's basically. an ocean of text. Yeah, so we're uh, immersed. Well, actually, in that's this Stephanie Strickland and, and Nick Monfield's yeah, idea right. of seeing far between. Yeah, which yeah is exactly. Just that's that's ocean it. Of text. Ocean of text. Yeah. We're about out of time, but I do want to mention a few things before I leave. I want to I want to um, give credit for the folks who've been putting this together. So you'll notice in the room, Dr. John Barber, Hanley Sound, yay. We have Greg Philbrook, our tech guru, who handles all the live streaming for us. Thank you. We also have the L team in the room, and that's um, Kathleen Zoller waving at us, Monica Roth, and, and, um, and also Holly Slocum and Andrew Nevu. So they have been doing everything from tweeting and Facebooking and all that stuff. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I also want to mention to all of you who are here, this uh, experience today is being done because we're trying to keep these works alive. As you probably have guessed, Story HyperCard is gone. It's not something you can put in your computer. And certainly, you don't have a place to put a CD-ROM anymore to read it. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to keep these works available to scholars and other people who might be interested in them. Once we're finished today, all mm -hmm. of these videos will be turned into video clips by Monica, and we'll be putting it on Vimeo, as well as in the multimedia book that the L team is putting together that Nicholas Schiller and the team and I are writing, and that is called Rebooting Electronic Literature, Volume 3. And so you'll see the video clips there. This event, um, wonderful event, the Q&A, also images that were taken today and beforehand, as well as the social media that's been um, created for today, all the posts. All of that goes into the book and will be made available for free, hopefully in the Scalar platform. Yeah, and I must add that I'm deeply grateful for her, all, all of your questions. I think that's, uh, that's what makes humanities worthy of um, studying, and actually that's the way uh, we should do it. Ongoing discussion, and, and I want to, I also want to acknowledge the presence of non-human beings around because uh, shortly before this um, session, I went for a walk at the nearby forest, and I'm sure my um, the way I, I, I read this uh, text today wouldn't be possible, wasn't it, for my contact with the trees around? Yes. So I wanted to acknowledge it. 
I want to thank Nicholas Schiller, who's the Associate Director of the lab, for, for his guidance and leadership with the students. He's part of the L team, but he stands apart from the undergraduate students. And thank you to my class members who are here and my faculty members, Will Lures, David Alonzo, and, um, I th and also uh, Richard Schneider. And we just lost Ted uh, Fordyce, who was here earlier. So, but thank you all for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And we have a faculty meeting.